Um, hate and healing, a path to forgiveness. As a reminder, please mute yourselves during this presentation. If you need help with that, I'm sure that uh, someone can help you. There'll be time for questions and answers afterwards. You may also use the chat feature to ask a question. As we gather in friendship together this evening to listen and to learn, let us remember that we are doing so on the sacred ancestral grounds of the Potawatomi, Ojibwa, and Ho-Chunk people. Tonight we'll remember that love is what we are born with, fear is what we have learned here. Fear of others who look different, speak and sound different, who may worship different, who may practice a different culture. Some Rotarians in 6270 have asked why Rotary is focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'd like to point to Rotary's four-way test, especially as it relates to DEI. Is it the truth? This is a fact. Diversity is a fact. Is it fair to all concerned? This is a choice. Equity is your choice. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? This is an action. Inclusion is the action. Will it be beneficial to all concerned? This is a result. Belonging is the result. I believe that Rotary is a force that can change the world. So when enough of us love, fear will dissolve. When enough of us find peace in our hearts, war will cease. When enough of us stand on what we know to be true, falsehoods will no longer hold sway. I'd like to thank our DEI team in 6270, some of, some of who are with us this evening. And um, I'm very proud to have led this team for the last two years. And we've done some phenomenal things here in our district. Uh, P G P D G Andrew Rester, Angie Rester, who has been a driving force and really my mentor will be chairing this committee next year. Maria Flores, who's been a great presenter. Diane Milner and Monica Phillip. And I don't think Frey are with us this evening. Lisa O'Halran, who is our district trainer and saved my bacon tonight. She is the one that sends all these amazing invitations. Thank you. Lisa, Natraj Shanker, who is our lead, who's led panel discussions and who will be our co-host this evening, who will gather and condense the questions that are in the chat. And finally, Lena Quinta, who will be moderating and will introduce our presenter and my friend, Pardeep. Len has been in Rotary for over 30 years. He is a past president of the Kenosha Rotary Club and a past assistant governor. Outside of Rotary, Len is a past president of the United Way of Kenosha County. In addition, the University of Wisconsin Parkside has recognized Len as a community engagement champion. Len is also one of my champions and he brings his DEI passion and his radio voice to us this evening. Thank you, Len. Thank you, Brian. Good evening. Our topic tonight is hate and healing, a path to forgiveness. Our guest is Pardeep Singh Kalika. You may remember his name. Nearly 10 years ago on August 5th, 2012, a neo-Nazi skinhead invaded a Gurdwara, a Sikh temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, just south of Milwaukee. His father and temple president, Satwant Singh Kalika, was killed, along with five other worshipers. A native of Punjab, India, Pardeep Singh Kalika grew up in Milwaukee. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree at Marquette University and a Master of Arts degree at Alverno College. Pardeep was a police officer and an educator in the inner city of Milwaukee. Today, as a therapist, his specialization is in holistic trauma-informed treatment with survivors of assault, abuse, and acts of violence. He is the proud father of four children. He is also the executive director of the Interfaith Conference Center of Greater Milwaukee. In addition, he leads an organization called Serve to Unite. Its educational program, quote, makes the practice of peace an attractive and valuable way of life, transforming schools and communities via fearless creativity and compassion in interdependent partnership with local and global peace efforts. Pardeep Kalika, welcome to District 6270's DEI series. Thank you so much, Len, and thank you so much to everyone. While I do I do have to lend your voice, Len, please let me borrow it, because it is like that, that <laughs> it's so it's so nice it's so calming um it is uh it is an honor to be here with you all and i am always just in awe of everything that you all do 
Um, I, I look forward to this discussion tonight. Um, and I just look forward to getting, you know, as, as Angela put it before, uh, you know, just seeing you all again. Um, hope to see you soon in person. Um, and as Natraj said earlier, I'm in Shorewood. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be going to uh, the local pub right after this. So let's, let's, you know, definitely have a conversation whenever we see each other. And uh, I hope, you know, I hope that our paths cross soon. So thank you, Len. I wanted to, I wanted to share, um, uh, if it's all right with everyone, just a short video that was created about a month and a half ago, maybe two months ago now. Um, and it kind of highlights somewhat of the conversation that we're going to have tonight around forgiveness, what it looks like, feels like. Um, again, it's not, it's not something that we can ever prescribe to anybody else, but it, it is something that we can all experience. And there is, there is very much uh, a faith component to it. Uh, there is some, somewhat of um, a resiliency component to it. And there, for me, it was a, a de, there was defiance um, and, and reclaiming life. And so I'm going to share this short video with you, and then we'll have the conversation. Is that okay? You'll recognize Portia Young. She is an anchor. This was a segment that was done on uh, American Dreams. Singh Kaliga has been a valued member of the Milwaukee community and has served in the public arenas of education, law enforcement, and social services. Pardeep is also the son of the late San Juan Singh Kalika, the founder of the Oak Creek Sikh Temple of Wisconsin, where on August 5th, 2012, a mass shooting took place that took the life of Pardeep's father along with five others. Pardeep sits down with 1036 producer Emmy Fink to share his thoughts on the American dream. When you think of the term, the American dream, do you look at what your dad did by coming over here with his family and wanting better? Yeah, I do think about my father and immigrants uh, like him. And I think those people that have been here and paved the way, um, those people that have, have essentially uh, been the leaders on civil rights movements have, you know, there's been so many people who embody the American dream. And I think it's, it's such a, um, you know, when I think about it, I think about a promise and I think about this country. And again, the life that my father led was, was one where he left the homeland. He left uh, everything that was comfortable to him to come and make it, make it here. I mean, he was a small business owner. He was, uh, um, he was a valued community member. He essentially built this, this Gudwara and built a sanctuary for other people to come to when he didn't have one when he first came here. So I think about all of that just courage that, that is embodied in the human spirit for everyone that does come. And I think about when we think about the American dream of this promise of what we want to do as we go forward. How do we make this, this country much more loving, much more inclusive, welcoming? How do we, how do we welcome in the refugees and the people who are are looking for refuge, uh, you know, how do we do that in a way that also respects the people that are here? But when we think about a history of America, I think about all of the pain that has been felt. And we have communities that continue to feel this pain. We have been facing, you know, two and a half, so, so many year, years uh, of a pandemic that has revealed pandemics within the pandemic. Uh, you know, uh, inequalities and injustices that continue to plague us. And when I think about the American dream, I think about how we as a country, as a collective, need to get better at listening to pain. And when we think about listening to pain, you know, not, not you know, again, traditional sort of mental health coping mechanisms of when we listen to somebody's pain, understanding and appreciating and then doing something about it, not denial, not, you know, guilt around it, not, not the sense of like rationalization or minimizing that we traditionally kind of go towards, but this genuine acceptance of here is what is going on. And here's what that looks like in our adults, in our children, 
Here's what it does to our neighborhoods. Here's what it does to communities. One time we called, you know, Milwaukee and Wisconsin, and we, we, you know, we used to call this a small village and a family. And now we've gotten to a place where we don't redirect another person's child. We don't, we don't really live as a community. We live as individuals living in different houses and different neighborhoods and different zip codes. And, and I think that at some point, this pandemic would have taught us one thing is that we are all in this together. Pradeep shared with me that the American dream and its need for equality is even found as a main pillar in the Sikh religion, equality among all races and religions showing true compassion and love to all people. A tradition following a Sikh gathering is a free communal meal called Lunger, and this represents selfless service to all, a promise that the American dream is still alive and well. And, and America still is very much, and I, I know over the years we have suffered a bit from what we thought America was, but but outside of this country, a lot of people still do look at us as the beacon, as as a place that you you can say, you know what, there is goodness, and and if there is injustices that exist in the world, then we can count on Americans and people in this country to be the ambassadors of goodwill. But I think that we need to mean it in, in, internally, and we need to heal from the inside out. And that means that we look at you know, the past 500 years, the past 1,000 years, and, 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 and say, you know what, I, I hear your pain. And now, since I've heard your pain and understood it, I'm going to do something about it. Milwaukee PBS, our story is you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a great way to begin our discussion, Pradeep. Why don't you take us back, um, take us back almost 10 years, and uh, where did your understanding come from? I've heard you uh, speak before, and uh, we didn't start out with love and forgiveness, did we? It must have been a little difficult the first days and hours and minutes of that horrible tragedy. Tell us a little bit about what it was and how that evolved for you and this incredible mission that you are on till today. Yeah, no, Len, thank you for that question. Uh, and uh, thank you for that. Um, just, just understanding that we don't always start with that same place that we end up as and that there is a process. And, um, you know, again, I don't, I, I tell this to people that I, forgiveness is not something that you can prescribe, uh, it's not something that you can kind of even, you know, I've worked with sexual assault survivors, other survivors of other horrific, and, and sometimes you feel like a hypocrite saying, hey, like, here's my story, and here's how I did it, and here's like, but, but I think that there's somewhat of like this imagination that is happening through that process of can I imagine a time when I'm going to be free of whatever this pain is that's holding me back from being who I'm supposed to be. And that, that particular day, I couldn't have imagined that. I couldn't have imagined that because I was under so much, there's so much rage and anger, and frustration. And you know, for the past 20 some years, 25 years now, I've been working in the fields of public service. First as, as you pointed out, as a police officer, then as an educator. And I think all of us have this internal discussion of, um, am I doing enough? Am I, like in my position where I am, where I am, have I done enough? And the guilt that day was really about, no, you haven't. You were in this place where you lived this middle-class lifestyle. You've, you know, you, you, did, you did what you could, but you hadn't done enough. And I think I wrestled with that internally of what else could I have done? And I know that that's not fair when something, something like this maybe even, even happens, but you have to understand my role within this community, this small minority community in South Milwaukee was, I've always been a bridge. I came here when I was six years old. I, you know, I, I understood the older generation and I understood 
the younger generation, meaning the, the new incoming immigrants. So I've, I've sat in that place of being that, that, that person, that middle child almost, of what America feels like. So I understood the dynamics. I, I, you know, there's lots of people who lost their, their, their families and their fathers that day that had no idea of what, what they even came into. But I, I did, I, mean, I was a history teacher. I got it, I understood it. And with that understanding, there's this need to make it like respond. But I felt the burden of that response. And, and I, I saw not only myself hurting, but a community that was completely shocked. Um, they, we had never seen anything like this. This is 2012. We are at the height of uh, Barack Obama's first term, and he's running for re-election again. And so there is you know, a rise in, in hate and hate crime and hate sentiment that's happening at that time. And when that happened, I, I, I saw lots of children within the Gudwara, and I saw them and I saw their pain. And I, and, and I looked at them and I said, at some point, it's not even about me anymore. It's about these children. And are these children gonna be able to get out of, the, get out of this pain long enough for them to become the next doctor, the next lawyer, the next politician, the next police officer? Or are they gonna be so traumatized that they sit insular and, and, and self-segregate themselves into their pain? And, but when you look at America, you see that all over the place. That's just not in sanctuaries or small minority communities. There's one thing of policies and history that has completely segregated neighborhoods into pain. But there's also this internal part where you sit in it long enough that you become, you become almost normalized to it. And I couldn't let that be the new normal at that time. So that was, that was very much the feeling of that day of, I knew I was angry, I knew I was upset, but I, I, I know that I had to be defiant so that these kids and everyone else could at one, some point imagine uh, something better than that day happening. I wonder, how did your background as uh, having been uh, a public safety officer affect you uh, on that day and immediately afterwards? Uh, I, I'm wondering if uh, that interacted with your emotions in any way and what sure. that felt like and what you might have felt afterwards looking back. And I think every officer will kind of tell you this. It's like when you put on the badge, when you put on the bulletproof, when you put on the bat belt, when you put on the gun and you wear that for eight hours a day and then you go home, you just don't take those things off. So whatever you pick up becomes a part of your experience, whether you like it or not, as you go forward. Um, trying to figure out the logistics of what happened, where it happened, right? I think that was part of my, my first, like, how do I respond to this? How do I find the command post? How do, I, how do I navigate this so that I can find out where my mom and my dad are? Right? Both my mom and dad were inside the Gudwar at the time. We were just a few minutes away. So not only did I have my son and my daughter, right? My daughter I'm about to go on this date with, <laughs> but I had, I, had, I had all of these people who were relying on things. My dad was the leader of this temple. He had been the president for 15 years. He, I mean, hands down was, was the, the biggest leader that this community had seen for, I mean, you know, and then like, how do you help all of those people? There was incredible responsibility. And I think that that's, that mimics law enforcement. A lot of times with incredible power comes incredible responsibility. And, and I think that's, that's the part of it that I went back to of like, okay, you can either, you can either worry about this, you can get overwhelmed, or you can work through this. So having to be there for the FBI to interpret, having to be there for, for this community so that they can grieve, raising funds for families. That night, we went back and came back the next day, and we started a GoFundMe page. Because I knew at, the, at that time, like, these are five other families who lost their main breadwinner, who lost the only source of income that these families have. What are these kids going to do? What are these nine-year-olds going to do? How are they going to get money? Who's going to donate to them? And, and 
you know, I, I, that was part of part of what I had to like, okay, start this GoFundMe page, raise funds, tell them who six are, because nobody knows, right? <laughs> and then if they don't know who you are, they're less likely to donate to you, right? You know, if they know who you are, they're more likely to donate this, this part of the human psyche. And so create a video. I created, a, we created a video with like the survivors' families, right? So the next day, this is how courageous the families were. Get on video, let's create a poem. This poem is gonna talk about who six are and what they mean to this country and the commitment that we have to healing this country. Well, party, I don't know if I can do that. I, I'm just, I just wanna just stay in my house. I, 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 don't, I wanna grieve, I wanna, nope, you don't have that luxury. Get out here and speak up on this microphone and tell them, you know what? We're, all, we're courageous, we're good, we're, we're strong, even if you're hurting, right? And, and people donated. And we got each one of those families $70,000 right away so that they can actually grieve. Then they went back. So, well, how are we going to pay for funeral costs? Okay, well, we'll get those donated too. So a, a, lot, of get, a lot of things just get lost on like how, how many actual logistical things were there? How many meetings? How many this? How many? I just remember being just incredibly fatigued, but also energized to say, "You all have to. You, we all have to do this." Now, you're taking care of everyone else. You're assuming responsibility in the absence of your father. Mm -hmm. Who's who's taking care of Mr. Kalika? And how did you evolve? I know that you have written this amazing book. Uh, and I've seen you be interviewed uh, with uh, your co-author of that book, who uh, was the founder of the neo-Nazi hate group, whose progeny of that group perpetrated this terrible tragedy. How, mm -hmm. Who took care of you and how did you take care of yourself and how did you evolve beyond those initial feelings and the, and the busy work of picking up the pieces of everyone's lives and the operations of the of, of the temple, how did that happen, uh, Lynn? That's a great question, and you know, I, I think in a way uh, there was an entire community that was surrounding surrounding all of us. We we know we had um, support from the broader community. I you know I tell Brian I said the interfaith community stepped up and said, hey, like you know what, we're going to reclaim sanctuary. Um, we, we need to reclaim it. We had, um, you know, we, we had, we had people who were like, who, who were there, but I think, I think in a way, family, right. Family. And then my children, um, I saw my, I saw my kids and oftentimes I would I tell people, I said, you know, I took life for granted before that. I really did. I mean, I, I just assumed things. I assumed we were going to go on vacation. I assumed life. I assume so many things that on a day-to-day -day basis, I just am like, people assume so much. And in that comes a sense of entitlement to the next day. After that, I stopped assuming and started just to be grateful. I was grateful for every conversation. I was grateful for meetings. I was grateful for the things that you're like, why in the world would you be grateful for that? I was grateful. You know, I, I remember this particular memory of sleeping or like sitting next to my children when they were, when they were sleeping. I took that for granted to watch a sleeping child in, in such a peaceful state before they, before they start to gather, right, all of the troubles of the world and take them as their own burdens, right? And, and I looked at them and I'm like, wow. I'm just amazed at God's glory at, at, and, and, and life. I was like, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to take anything um, for granted. Not one day, not one relation. And I started to hug them and kiss them like they were like going to leave for, you know, for like a year. And maybe they were just going to school. And my, my wife would tell me like, you hug them a little too long. You, you know, you're, you're by them a little too, you'd let them sleep in our bed way too, often. you know, all of these things, right? And, um, and that's what, you know, when we talk about post-traumatic growth, 
is that I, I was, I almost felt overwhelmed by all of the people that I was surrounded by. It almost became too much. Like it was like, wow, when you, when you really, when you really feel it, know it, you're like, you, you would be overwhelmed. And people are like, well, people are so isolated. They're so lonely. There's like, no, you just haven't taken the time to notice all that is around you. You just, and so there was something within that, but to answer your question, to come back to your question, right? People, family, my children, work, but in, in a way, I knew that I was also covered. I knew that I knew that things were happening and, and I couldn't explain it. And, you know, uh, meeting Arno was something that just came up sort of in, from a place. And as that meeting, and Arno, for you that, for you that don't know, is a former skinhead. Um, he started the same gang or organization that Wade Page belonged to, who was the shooter. It's called the Hammerskin Nation. And today they have become one of the most violent uh, neo-Nazi sort of groups in the world. At that time when Arnold founded it, he they came from Chicago up to Milwaukee. And as he was doing that, he had his own self-discovery. And so when I reached out to him, um, part of it was to understand and part of it was to like, kind of like, why do people do like these things? But there was also another intention. The other intention was we need to get further upstream as a society to see pain on people like this so that we can do something about it. And today that's some of the work that I do is I do de-radicalization therapy with people who are known as domestic terrorists or foreign terrorists and all these people. And, and you know, I think that people ask me the question like, why, like, why is it, and you know, why is it that you're effective at it? Why is it that you even do this? There's only a handful of people in the United States that can do this work. I'm like, I don't know, God has given me the ability to see people's pain. I don't really concentrate too much on the presenting behavior. So I see behind that. And I don't think that I would be able to do that if I, if I never had that relationship with Arno. So, and I think that's for every one of us. God puts us in a place that, that really allows us to be who we're meant to be. Did you seek each other out or uh, tell me a little bit more about how you, you met? Uh, I, I, it I seems him. extraordinary that you would have connected <laughs> at all. Yeah, Len, no, I, I sought him out as I contacted, I contacted him and said like, hey, you know, you used to live this lifestyle. Um, I would like to meet up. And, uh, you know, we, we emailed a couple of times, talked on the phone, decided to meet up and, uh, and, and, and we met and, uh, you know, that, that was, that was how, that, that was how he was introduced. Yeah. A lot of people. How, are, how did that feel? I, I, I can't imagine putting myself in your, in your head, in your shoes in that situation. I, I, I it boggles my mind uh, and, and, and I, I have empathy as much as I can muster for the situation, but I, I, I just can't imagine what that was like. Can you, can you remember what that was like and how it felt to you? Like it was yesterday. Yeah. Like uh, it was scary. It was very, very, it was very scary. As to, I mean, that, I think that was part of it. There was a lot of me that was putting on a brave face for the world because again, it was my duty. It was my responsibility. I knew I had to do it, um, but I, I felt an agitation. I felt an agitation on just you know the, the way that everything went went and happened. So I was struggling through those feelings. And there was a part of me that also knew that if I was gonna do this work genuinely, right? I needed to forgive. I didn't know that at the time. Right? I didn't know, I, I couldn't even talk, to, let, let you, uh, but I remember as I reached out to him and I started to tell my wife and other folks, hey, I'm reaching out to, you know, to the, like they, they start to think about and like, you like, have you lost your mind? Right. And there's a part of me that was also wondering the same thing. Like, have I lost my mind? Like these kids, I shouldn't be hugging them that long. I shouldn't like, I shouldn't be feeling like this. Like, I, like there's a feeling of like overvaluing life that people are like, you're strange. You're weird. Just take things for granted. Like the rest of us do. 
then you'll be fine. So, you know, whatever, you, whatever. You, so you start to feel strange to people. And then you start to feel strange to yourself. And I've started to feel that way, right? I'm like, maybe I am going through something. Maybe this is post-traumatic stress. This is what, this is what everybody kind of talks about. And you know, then you start to like move forward. And there's always this push. There's, I felt it. I'm like, okay, I, I don't, I don't want to do this. And then push. And I remember the first time when we actually physically met and I saw him. And here was this person. And, you know, Arnold is like 6'2", six, 6'3", six, uh, kind of a big guy at the time. We were both kind of skinny. We both worked out quite a bit. And, you know, he's, he's kind of an intimidating person. And when I saw him going into the restaurant, he went in first and then I, I was going to go in after him. And I, again, there was that decision and we all, all of us have this decision to make all the time, right? We had this decision tonight, whether we wanted to show up to this, whether we didn't want to show up to this, all of us make these decisions all of the time. And that, that night when I saw him go walk in, I was going to give an old excuse of like, Hey, you know, uh, my kids got sick and I had to be home and this thing, that thing. And I saw, I saw myself and I write in, in, in our book, uh, the gift of our wounds. I talk about this. I, I start to like, shift the, shift the gears and start to put the car into like drive. And I was going to drive off and call him up, but then something said, no, you came this far. You have come this far. Now do what you're supposed to do. And that's, it's strange to even like say that, to like, but there's something that said, do what you're, you're meant to do in your lifetime. Go in and go, 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 go meet this person. So I put the car back in park. I walk in and I, and I go meet him and walk up to him. And, you know, he, I'm thinking all the way to, to walking up to him, like, what am I going to say to this guy? What, what are the answers that I need to know that I couldn't have gotten from? anywhere else, right? What is he gonna say to me? What questions does he have for me? So I'm thinking about all these different things and all of a sudden, and you guys can all see that like my eye right here, um, when I sit in the sun too long, it kind of goes up and like this. Um, and that's because like a week before this meeting, I had a horrific eye incident where like this hanger went through my eye and came out of the other side. Right? And the first time that he sees me, he said, he asked me, he's like, dude, what happened to your eye? And me, I was like, what did happen to my eye? I completely forgot that my eye was like bandaged open. And the only way that I used to blink was like the tape would hold it open like this. And the way I blink was like this with my finger. <laughs> and, and I'm explaining this to him and I see him grimacing and I see like him kind of like feeling so basically our relationship started off from not a place of answers or explanations, but of empathy. Empathy. Understanding. Empathy. Hmm. Yeah. Let's, let's think about that a little bit. Uh, what does that mean? What does that mean to the rest of us? What, what does that need to mean to the rest of us, Pradeep? Yeah. I mean, for, for all of us, I think that we need to engage in a lot of just feeling work, right? And, and I, you, you know, I still have those clients and I, I let them know, we can feel, we can heal. If we don't, we won't. And it's sometimes it's just that simple. I have young men who get into ideologies that cause them to be very explanatory. And I'm like, how does that make you feel? And they can't tell me how it makes them feel. They're so disassociated. And, and I think the world is getting to that place where we just have so much stimuli, so, so much information that is coming at us on a day-to-day -day basis that it's like, what happened to empathy? What happened to feeling work? What happens to ex that exercise that, that exercises a different part of us? So to me, I mean, it's, it's really everything. All, all of our workshops, all of the work that we've done over the past you know, 10 years with thousands and thousands of students has evoked that feeling of how does this make you feel?
Now, I want to get into that work in, in some detail with both of the organizations you're, you're involved with. But first, um, I, I'm curious, forgive me, uh, but um, I hope this isn't just idle curiosity, but I think it will make a point, I hope. Uh, we have just been through uh, several weeks of violent shooting incidents uh, all across the country. Um, what happens to you when that when you read about these things and i wonder what happens to your congregation and and whether there are still this decade later uh resi residual effects that um, per perpetuate the uh, the tragedy but still inform maybe a greater depth of living and spirituality at the same time mm -hmm. yeah that's a great question i think for me um you know, it's, it's, a, it's a gut punch and it's, it should be because I think that there's a healthiness of knowing that we just haven't had the courage to make the changes we need to make to keep people protected. Um, so I think, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I let that be known. Like we need to have courage if we're going to move forward with a world, you know, with the United States that's growing in size with a world of 7 billion people with having more and more weapons and machinery of destruction and chaos, we better um, exercise that muscle of empathy. Because I, I mean, we, we just have so much of an ability to cause harm. For our community, you know, people handle things differently. Uh, I remember coming in and people wanting to move forward with their life. And again, I'm just, there was a reminder there, there that we have a responsibility. This was the deadliest hate crime committed at a place of worship um, in nearly 50 years by an affiliated white supremacist. Since the time the four little girls endured the impact of a bomb intended for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We have a responsibility to every one of these incidents that happen, but some people in the congregation just wanted to move forward. So one day I uh, had to remind them of what was happening because most of the people, the leadership there wasn't inside the temple at the time. So I bought a boom box, a jam box about this big. And I played as loudly as I could nine millimeter rounds. And to the point that they said, stop, stop playing that, stop playing. I can't. And I said, I'm, I'm sure that the people that were in here at the time wanted the shooting to stop too. I'm sure the people who were shot wanted the shootings to stop. I'm sure when they felt the heat of that, the, 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 the blood coming out of their wounds, they wanted that to stop. But they didn't have that option. There's a part of me, you know, and even like this was a couple of days after people probably came up to me and said, party, we cleaned up, we cleaned up the carpets, we ripped out the carpets, we put a new, we, we cleaned up the blood off the walls. And I wanted to say, why didn't you just leave it there? Leave the blood on the walls, leave it in the carpet. Because we are too quick to move forward. You all are trying to move forward when something is saying, pay attention to this pain. And we do it all the time. Next, next headline, next headline, next headline, next headline. Well, some people don't have that ability to move forward. So they still exist in it. So, I mean, even 10 years later, they're understanding, they're, I think they're getting better at understanding the value of addressing that at that moment. But, but I, I would love to say that all of them got it. Um, you know, it's just like any congregation, some of them get it, some of them don't. And, and it takes all of us within our different dynamics of wherever you are to say, okay, I can do something about this, this particular relationship here, right? Begin by beginning. Now you're in this restaurant, you've met Arno, this former skinhead. You have, a, I imagine, a very deep discussion. And then you get to working together and we write a book and it's called The Gift of Our Wounds. Tell us about, tell us about Serve to Unite, your organization. Uh, I've 
looking at the uh, front page of your website here that I've printed out. Uh, you uh, talk about this gift of our wounds book. You talk about Serve to Unite, the name of your organization, and a Parents for Peace initiative. I wonder if you would just tell us a little bit about that. And I'm struck by the title, The Gift, the Gift of Our Wounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's just a when we thought about when we thought thought about what the title was going to be, and both of us over over the process, you know, got to a place where we understood that there is a gift to our wounds, right? Not to say there's just a silver lining or anything like that, but somehow, some way, it's an imaginative exercise. It's to say at some point, you know what I need to I need to get to a place where this person or what happened to me doesn't define me. And, and I think that was a part of like the gift of our wounds highlights possibility. And so I've heard from like lots of clients who ask that, like, you know, what is the name of your book? I had one particular client um, sexually abused by his uncle. And this was a young man who was very, very angry at life. Who, I mean, and he had the right to be. He had the right to be. And I just remember he asked, you know, what, what is the name of your book? The Gift of Our Wounds. And there was something that was happening inside of him that was like, hmm. And he didn't speak after. He just kind of was like, I didn't think about it that way. I've, I've been holding this for so long. It's been affecting my relationships. It's been affecting my, you know, just everything, my every part of life. I never thought about it this way. And, and so I think it's for me, it just was giving people the possibility of what does that look like for you? What is, how, do, how do you process your own, whatever you have to do? And sometimes people come and say, like, like, party, how do I do that? Like, I'm like, bro, sis, I can't, I cannot prescribe it to you. I, I can't, I, I wasn't there for whatever you've gone through. So, but I can tell you that at some point, in some way, like that it is possible that, that you can introduce this to. Him. So that was, that was really what we, and, and that kind of came out gradually as we started to travel. And this was the work of Serve to Unite and even like Parents for Peace or other initiatives that we've taken on, even with Interfaith was Arno and I would get into uh, an auditorium and we spill our guts. And almost, eight, you can count on it that there would be 20 to 30 students. He would take on one side of the auditorium and I would take on another 20 to 30. And it got so overwhelming that at some point I would have to ask the administrators, hey, like at some point, after like an hour and a half, like come get me, come like come. And so that was the part that I, you know, Arnold had, had a bigger capacity to be able to, but part of it was like, like you would hear it all the time. Students are like, I feel suicidal. I, I've tried to hurt myself. Here's what happened. And, and like, this is each student coming up. And I was like, why, why is that like these students didn't, weren't able to do this before? Why two strangers who came to your town, like to your town, and, and spill their guts about their respective stories, right? One being a neo-Nazi and the, and the one like, you know, going through this bit. And I'm like, huh, they recognized openness. And so, you know, when, when I say when, when minds speak, minds listen. When hearts speak, hearts listen. So we never rehearsed anything that we had to talk about. We would actually make that a rule of like, Arnold, do that. Party, do not, whatever comes to you in that moment, look that person in the eye and say what you need to say. And they may say something back to you. And so again, it was, it was about us initiating that possibility of like- Authenticity. Authenticity, yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about what you're doing now in both of the organizations in the Greater Milwaukee Interfaith Council and in Serve to Unite. I think that we'll all be interested in, in knowing uh, how you've put this anger and this 
evolution and this forgiveness that you now feel and understanding in a greater context how do you operationalize that and try to change lives and trajectories of other communities one sure. school one person one community at a time sir sure sure so um you know through interfaith one of the things one of the initiatives that i really wanted to like engage in is how how does the faith community understand uh, and is informed by mental health. I am a clinician. Uh, my background is is clinical therapy, right? So I wanted to kind of bring that in and say, okay, like how do we understand the scripture and the book and the Quran and the Hadiths and the Quran and you know the Guru Granth and all of these scriptures to say because when you read them, I can read them and say, this is trying to provide healing. This is trying to elicit healing. So why in the world does a person come to a church or a synagogue or a masjid and sit outside of it and look inside and say, I can't go in there because I'm damaged. When we should be learning from the damaged person, when that should be our teacher, they should be sitting in the front row. They should be teaching the sermon, right? We have more, so when, when I, when I, when I, I was like, this is not what we're doing. People are falling away from all of these faiths because they feel a sense of shame in their pain. And they don't feel like they can do that. And we're not doing a good enough job to kind of, you know, have the wisdom of the well meet the living water. So interfaith is, is that, is like, I want the wisdom of this well to meet the living water. The scripture and everything it has, and I'll speak about Sikhi. It has been co-opted by people who have no idea that they're co-opting it. They don't know. Our 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 teachers don't know. They they you know, and it, part of it is like you have to go meet them out there. Yes, they're outside the Gurdwara walls. Walk your butt outside of the temple and go meet them and call them in. And at some point, I felt like we, we have stopped doing that. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a short, that's a long story about that. And, and Surf Tea Night was the same way of like having, having schools be able to understand social emotional growth of a child through service learning. Um, yeah, and then, you know, the work that I do with, with those that are radicalized now, um, it's, the, it's the same thing of like trying to meet people and we're trying to create a new way of thinking about, um, you know, the way that people show up and express themselves. So, you know, I have a, I have a child who's a cutter. I have a child who is, you know, who may want to create a, who may want to make a bomb and, and harm a community. I may, I may have a, an adult male who, you know, is gathering weapons and guns and wants to shoot up, uh, uh, you know, a place. Like there has to be people who understand that that is a manifestation of their communication. They have somehow in this, in this American fabric learned that power over models, right, are healthy and especially our males. And at some point we have to rethink what America looks like, especially from a masculine, like, standpoint of like that, that it's it's not you don't have power over you have power with you don't you don't you are not the ultimate judge you are the ultimate person who empowers another person so share your light as you know uh, rotary international um, has been founded uh, long ago by paul harris on the principle of fellowship and communication and working together and we are involved in all sorts of community benefit projects locally, regionally, and around this globe. Um, you have an audience here of um, thought leaders of Rotary and members of clubs from all over the district that are listening tonight and that will listen to this recording later. And it'll be used in club programs, I'm sure. So what would, what would you tell us? What would you tell me as an individual Rotarian, Mr. Klinka and... Uh, what would you tell Rotary clubs uh, in our district? What, what should we be thinking about uh, 
as some of the core values that our work, our projects, our good works should uh, embody. You know, one of the first talks that um, I think we did, I think this was my brother and I, was with the Rotary. Um, I think it was the downtown Rotary over by Lincoln Memorial. And again, just I, I'm, I'm amazed. And then you see it all over the place. You, you know, people are like the world is, you know, the bad or corrupt or whatever. Yeah, no, we have to, we have to, we have to think about that for sure. But there are so many people who are doing great work. And I, and I tell those people, you have to double down. You have to, you have to kind of recommit. You have to feel that push. And it is very much a two-way. You're not just going to feel that push if you're not searching for that feeling. If you're not looking deep inside and saying, well, I could do more. I could, I could show up to this and I could show up to that. So again, just continuously show up, show up for people. There's, there's a lot of people who are struggling right now. Um, and I'll challenge, maybe lovingly challenge everyone to kind of think about what is the relationship that has been fractured over the past two or three or four years? Whether it's because of politics, whether it's because of um, you know, the pandemic, what does that relationship, that fractured relationship look like and feel like and who was it with? And I really lovingly challenge you to have that dialogue with them. To go back there and revisit and maybe maybe sometimes you need some separation of space and time but maybe maybe rekindle whatever that relationship is going to look like as it goes forward if you can if it's not one that causes you extreme extreme pain or de dehumanizes your being right but if it's something that's that's just difficult let's revisit those conversations and go, go ahead and help some of those people who are struggling with whatever they're struggling with. Tell me, is your book still in print? Your book, uh, The Gift of Our Wounds, and how might one uh, get a copy of it besides so. going to the library? <laughs> and I know but, we could all go to the library and get a book. I'm, I'm a former library board member. We love our libraries. But if I wanted one for my own personal use or I'm a digital reader, uh, how could I go about getting one? Yeah, no, no, Len, it definitely is in print. Um, you can order from most most uh, major bookstores. Um, it's on, it, you know, it's, it's published. Uh, it'll be in print for for a while. Maybe you can get get it used. But uh, yeah, if you can if you can support us and just kind of buy it um, instead of renting it, um, I would love to. Like again, um, I'm in Shorewood. Uh, if you see me around and you got the book with you, I'll sign it. Um, and uh, yeah, just uh, you, yeah, you can you can get it anywhere. And, and there, the greater, there's an audio version too. There's oh, yeah. good. Is then the Greater Milwaukee Interfaith Council? If someone wants to get involved with it in the Greater Milwaukee area, or sure. wants to learn more about your work, so they might emulate pieces of it uh, within their sphere, uh, how would they find out more about that? Pretty yeah. So you can go to um, uh, interfaithconference.org um, if you want to keep up. I just kind of put it up there earlier. But if you want to keep in touch, um, we can keep in touch on Facebook. Uh, I'm that way. I like Facebook. Uh, we do Instagram, and I just don't like Twitter all that much. But we can do Instagram, Facebook. Um, let's yeah, let's let's stay in contact. And if there's something that you weren't able to ask tonight, uh, you can contact me at partyp.kalika at yahoo.com. It's in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our guest. We have learned a lot from you tonight, and I'm going to turn back to our uh, co-host, uh, Brian Monroe, uh, who will do some summarizing, and we will soon be fielding questions from our participants. Thank you again, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for a phenomenal job this evening, as always. <clears throat> and uh, there's a couple of things that jumped out at me, Party, when you mentioned, uh, listen to others' pain and show empathy, how important empathy is. Uh, the comment, if you can feel, you can heal. We are really all in this together. And the sooner that we realize that, the sooner we can heal and avoid this, the situations that um, put 
people who feel that they're separated from us and have to do something to hurt others. Because everyone, all beings want to feel safe, experience happiness and embrace joy. So after your encouragement, I'm going to practice gratitude and take nothing for granted. So thank you, Pardeep. Uh, we will open it up to questions. If uh, we'll watch the chat. So if you want to say something in person to Pardeep, um, please, I'll do, I'll the sooner, I'll do it in order as you enter the chat. Um, one thing I can do a plug for our Rotary Club, MT Sunrise. Pardeep will be our guest speaker on Friday morning, the 15th of July. So if you want to meet him in person and get your book signed, please join us on the 15th of July in Mequon at Mequon's Public Market. Well, that's great. That's a good way of like, yeah, like you guys got to get the book and, and let's get it signed. That's... <laughs> I don't see any hands up, but I don't see any questions at this point. Oh, it looks like Angela has a question. Well, quick question um, and thought, because you probably know about like the gentleman, the Japanese prisoner of war and uh, the Japanese uh, camp guard that worked together to us appreciate and became great friends. Um, and Sierra Leone, the amputees became, they were forgiving of the amputators, the guys that came with their machetes and chopped off their hands. Um, looking at what you've done with Arnold and then I know about like women who have befriended the person who killed their child and is in prison. Is anybody talking about doing something on a bigger, grander level that shows how people in different places have healed and have forgiven? Because right now you're like individual stories, but you know how all of those together are more powerful? So there was this, um, and it's still there, um, it's called the Forgiveness Project. And it was founded by uh, the Dalai Lama and uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And we were part of that project. And what this basically, and then, and then there's also books on that called the F word, or, and lots of people think about the F word as like, you know, the F word, but you know, forgiveness being the F word. And then there's recipes on forgiveness and things like that. And when you read those books, Yes, like a, it's a completely different definition of what we usually think about forgiveness or what children think about for what forgiveness means. It's, you know, when, we, when I think about forgiveness, I think it's a vengeful act to reclaim life, right? To reclaim who you're supposed to be, reclaim being, right? And it's, there's a violation that was done or multiple violations that were done to people to say, and, and you know, we all have, that ability, that capacity to kind of reclaim our life. You know, they maybe come with more work. Um, but one of the things that we asked for students when they were in schools was, look at this story right here. And that story would be a little bit, and like it wouldn't be familiar to them because sometimes we get lost in, you know, what's happening in Milwaukee and what's this and that. And these stories would be a bit not familiar to them. Uh, you know, a story that comes up to mind right away that we utilized was, the circumcision of African women and the circumcision of African women done by family members as part of their culture. And this particular person had to go back and say, like, why did you, why did you do that? And that their father would be like, well, this was part of our culture. This is what we knew. And that person was able to articulate, well, this took away part of my being. It took away part of me. And, and, and then that father, you know, because they, they heard their daughter say that, right, was able to stop the next ones from happening. So to stop the next, the, you know, the next generation from carrying on that legacy, that, that you know, that tragic legacy of trauma. And, and I think that's, you know, when we think about Forgiveness Project, we would ask the students, what, what is it that you can do to stop the legacy of trauma here? What are some projects that you will take on? What did forgiveness mean in this particular context? Did she ever forget about it? Did she ever just move on with her life and say, I'm going to engage in relationships and, for, and just leave that person there? Like, what did it feel like? And, and students oftentimes would be like, well, I, 
I didn't think about forgiveness in those in that term in that way. Like I thought that forgiveness was like, and and like that 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 was the part of the program that we would like kind of like okay let's let's take another story let's take another story so we would use that as curriculum, and and teachers can use that that's all up there, the further forget forgiveness project, and then we would also teach on that country's history, and say where is the regionality of this country, who are the people that live there. What is the faith that they practice? How many people live there? What has been the economy of this? What is the major? So like all of these, I, I tell teachers, I'm like, make it relevant. Make it mean something, make it real. Make it address social, emotional growth, right? Like it, it's like, you're teaching people stuff that doesn't mean anything. And then, and that they, so the, yeah, we, we have utilized that on that scale. But again, I think that it can be utilized at a much larger scale. Oh yeah. <laughs> I didn't necessarily have anything to say. I just enjoy uh, listening to you share your ideas, especially as one of the premier thought leaders in this work. So um, it's a joy to be able to hear you. It's good to see you, Jim. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's great. It's great to see you all. Um, um, yeah, I don't have, oh, go. Yeah, sorry. Pradeep, um, I don't know that you would know, and I did post it in here, but Rotary has always been committed to peace, world peace, which is why it has all these exchange programs, because it's believed that if we get to know the person on the other part of the, in the other part of the planet, we will be less likely to bomb them. And if we get to realize that we really have so much in common, maybe we won't judge the person down the street. Uh -huh. But this past council, we actually voted to change our, um, our constitution, our documents to state that we aren't just in support of peace. We are now supporting positive peace, which is different. It's very new though for Rotarians as a whole to think about that or even put their arms around it. How does someone like you or the people that you know out there in the Southeastern Wisconsin, I'll start with, who should we be using and, and, and tapping into to help us truly move forward in what we say we want to be about? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think what you bring up as far as like peace and reconciliation and, and reconciliation really being the focus on, and I think this is something that we really wanted to, in schools, we would often, sometimes we get in trouble a little bit of like, you can't bring that up. You can bring all that stuff up. Like even the first school that we spoke at, three people had committed suicide. And the principal was the administrator was like, uh, party people, don't bring that up. And you know me, I'm, I'm defiant in that way of like, okay, I won't, but I will <laughs> do this. <laughs> you know, hey, you know, I've, we've lost people in our lives. I've lost somebody in my life for the next, you know, minute. Let's just have a moment of silence and let's just, and then you can hear the whimpering in the crowd of people who hadn't just, who hadn't processed their friend's death. And, and so, yeah, I, I'm big on bringing up what the issue is of like, let's just bring it up. Why are we, why are we sugarcoating? Why are we like, let's bring it up. If it is, you know, if it is Israel, Palestine, if it is conflict that whatever it is, let's bring it up. Because if we can't get to a better place and see divinity in, in the next person that doesn't look like us, walk like us, talk like us, dress like us, believe like us, we, we're not doing the work, right? And, and I think that the next generation will not benefit from us doing the work. So, so that's, that, that's, you know, that's that. And I think one of the people that really brings that up uh, and that comes front to mind is a good friend, you know, Reggie Jackson. And, and Re Reggie is great at like helping you understand the historical sort of like, this is what was happening, but then he also brings that together. So he brings the mind and the heart together. And I, I think there's, there's lots of people who do that, but he's, he's coming in front of mind of like, like, Hey, the, here's, here's what was going on. Here's the history of it. And here's why that history still lives on, you know, whether it's, in statutes or whether it's in culture, you know, whether it's in, like, I, I oftentimes we, we talk a lot about culture and cultural shifts take a long time 
it, it takes you getting dirty. It takes you in there, right? Of like constantly kind of tilling the, the, the soil that's been so soiled and whatever, like the, the harm and the blood and everything that's there. But that's, that's, yeah, I think there's a lot of good artists that do that work as well. Um, I, I love, I love sometimes thinking about it from the, from the place of like, let's get away from traditional, even like, I, I, you know, I get to talk for a long time today, but like, let's evoke something else like music or painting or doing something that may bring about a different part of our, our heart and our brain. Pardeep, uh, talking, about, talking about culture, do you feel that there is a culture of hatred that is growing across the world today? And what is it that we can do to help sort of dampen that sort of rise, if you may? Yeah, I, I, I do. I think there's, there's, you know, within as optimistic as, as, I am, it's, uh, it's defiantly optimistic. So defiantly meaning like, um, I, I wanna focus and I wanna think about the problem. We, we need, as we're doing this work, if we're working on treatment modalities, we have to see what the harm is. We can't like look away from the cut and say, oh, well, you know what, it'll heal itself. Well, no, it, yeah, maybe it will. Maybe at some point it does heal itself, right? The human body has that capacity, but we also have the capacity to help it. We have the capacity. So I think there is a lot of harm, a lot of hurt, a lot of division. And I think that we find creative ways to think that we're different from somebody else. And so it's not, it's, I think people are getting smarter, but that intelligence is causing people to also be separated. And so the, like human capacity to go on in evolution and live relatively peaceful somebody can say party well you know we live till our 90s now we don't suffer from the same diseases that we did before and and you know people are enjoying a uh, sort of a, 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 a livelihood that uh you know allows them to have whatever they have I'm like yeah that's why i'm coming to a place where like we take all of this for granted mm -hmm. and because we do we, you know, we're, 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 you know, more, more of us are having anxiety, like anxiety related disorders. Where does anxiety come from? Well, it comes from over worry, over worry of what? That you're going to lose something. And if you're going to lose something because you thought that it was entitled to you, well, there, there's, there's a sacrifice to all of this when you didn't think that it was all given to you. And in this, particularly this, this, this country here, Right. I, I think that sometimes, you know, you and I, we came here relatively new, but you're dealing with a country who is like, you know, there's been conflicts between black and white. There has been harm between black and white. And, you know, Dr. Joy DeGruy talks a lot about generational trauma disorders, like basically trauma being passed down through generation after generation. And I can almost see it that a lot of my clients of color will have a trauma related disorder diagnosed to them. Okay, there's disassociation, there's pain, there's other things. It's a trauma related disorder. And then I will see sometimes a lot of my white clients and not, not to stereotype this, will have anxiety related disorders. They're over worrying. There's constant, like their mind is going off all the time, right? And it's like, oh, in this country, are we, is pain meeting worry? Is that what we're seeing on our television screens? This pain meeting this worry all this time? And I think when you go to, to the world to ask this question, like, like you're seeing that happen all over the place because you have majority cultures, you have minority cultures, you have those cultures that were harmed and you have those cultures that benefited from that harm, right? right? So there's the fear of loss, of losing something that you feel like as give, is supposed to be yours. Right. What, what I mean, what is we're talking about great replacement theories in this country, right? Where what what fear is that you like kind of tapping into? You'll lose something. Right. And then politicians know this. <laughs> they, they know this. 
they're just they're just capitalizing on it. So I think I think if we bring that all out and say, okay, here's what's happening. This is meeting this, and it's causing this. How do we help heal? Thank you. Okay, buddy, I do have a question for you. <laughs> so I'm curious how you would talk about the difference between empathy and compassion, especially in this work that we do. Man, Jim, you had to ask. That's a stump <laughs> question. That's a <laughs> that's a stump. So empathy and compassion. Well, let, let me just let me just not. I wasn't trying to set you up here. I mean, yeah. it, I really wasn't. I, it was a legitimate inquiry because we often come at it from two different places. Yeah. And, and, and one leans a little bit on judging and the other one is connecting. And that's where I was really coming from with that. Yeah, no, I, I, I was gonna say, I, th I think, yeah, I think empathy and, and compassion. Oftentimes I think about empathy as in like, empathy is something that you feel for someone outside of oneself. Right. But compassion is something that you give yourself. Yes. So not that they have to be separate, but I think that even forgiveness, uh, for compassion, all of these things are gifts that we give oneself to say, hey, if I give it to you, I automatically, right? I'm the one who gave the gift. So I'm the beneficiary of it. And then empathy is, and, and but yeah, it, and you said it, it's a, the difference between like edu like kind of like being educated about something and mm -hmm. yeah yeah Jim Jim has this, this man you must have, like all those books back there <laughs> they, they they make me look like I know something but I'm still trying to learn them so that's all right. yeah I'm trying to be like you and get that get that nice gray beard <laughs> so you know the compassion I think is a uniting opportunity for all of us actually because it takes judgment out. It doesn't, uh, it's a foundation that, that supports what equity really means to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think you alluded to it earlier, quite frankly. Uh, yeah, uh, I, 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 I think about equity is like, it is, it is very much policy work, mm -hmm. it is systematic, systemic work, but it's also like heart, deep heart work. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the part that like, it comes back to how much courage can we have? You know, I genuinely do believe that um, there's a part of me that's and people are like, are you sick? Are you Hindu? Or are you like this? That? I'm like, if this is the last of this lifetime that I have, and I come back as a different form, or I come back as a, like, it's also self serving. It's, it's like, if I don't come back as an Indian Punjabi person, I may come back at, and like, how do we create a culture as we go forward to say, Hey, like we we need to, you know, we need to, and then it's also a matter of survival. Is that if we don't create a more compassionate society, I don't know how much 10 billion people on this earth are going to be able to like, you know, handle each other. Thank you, Pardeep. Thank you, Jim, for that great question that you asked us. And uh, you know what? You're absolutely right. Those are people talk about things they when you give something away physically, you've lost it. When you give away compassion, love, and empathy, it's a gift back to yourself, and you never run out of it. No. So, no. thank you so much, Pardeep. Thank you, Len. Um, thanks for everyone that put this program together tonight. It has been recorded. It will be uploaded on District 6270's YouTube channel. And